Welcome to the podcast. It is rare that charities get headlines, try as they might to shine the light on their work. But for the last few months, the reverse has been true. We wake up to a daily dose of headlines about the WE charity, its founders, their relationship to the, to the Trudeau government, and how they deliver their mission. Along with this steady drip, drip, drip of details that are emerging on the politics and the process, of the decisions made by the Trudeau government, there is also a steady rise of interest about charities and questions about how they operate. Should charities own real estate? Should they run for-profit enterprises to fund their charitable work? How much money do they really need? In this podcast, we speak to Hilary Pearson, who is a renowned expert on charities. We go deep into the charities into the issue of charities and how they have been hit by the global pandemic and the reputational hit of the weed revelations on the entire sector. It really was an, an, an illuminating conversation about charity, Senator. You know, as you mentioned, charities are not always in the spotlight. We actually saw that when the Senate report on charities was released in June 2019, and it virtually got no media coverage despite it being one of the most downloaded reports in Senate history. And, you know, people, when they think about charities, they think about all the good works that they do, but they also don't think about the economic driver that the sector is for the country. It employs over 2 million people and contributes about 8% of the Canada's GDP. So it is a very important sector for everyone in, in Canada, not only deliver, delivering services, but an economic driver. So there, there has been decades of neglect and misunderstanding about the sector and specifically how it operates that now seems to have uh, risen to the forefront because of the WE controversy. But this neglect is endemic. It has also led to a sector that is governed by legislation that was drawn up in the 1950s and has not been reviewed since then. It is governed by laws conceived essentially in, in Elizabethan times, it does not reflect a modern Canada. That needs to change, and Hilary Pearson will provide great insight how it can do so. Let's get to the interview. So I'm delighted to be here and to talk today about charities. Our first guest, synonymous with charities almost, is Hillary Pearson. People who, who are deep into charities as I am, but and even if you're not, may well recognize Hillary's name because of her long outstanding career in the charitable sector. Why are we talking about charities? Well, for a couple of obvious reasons. One, charities are in the headlines almost every day today as a result of the WE controversy. In, in this spotlight, I would suggest to our listeners is is new for the sector because for the greatest part they're not able to get the attention of the media or of the politicians uh, even if they are essential uh, to providing essential services to canadians further and these are interesting uh, factoids to keep in mind they are the sector is a huge employer it employs two million canadians full-time and uh, another I believe more than a million part-time. Uh, it contributes 8% to the GDP, but frankly, the most important uh, uh, feature of the sector is, I believe very firmly, it is the glue that holds Canadians together from coast to coast to coast. So in this context, the media coverage is somewhat unfortunate because has portrayed charities in a certain light, and it has also really not allowed charities or the media to discuss the context in a, in a fulsome way, which is why we come to Hillary. But before we get to the weighty matters of this conversation, I want to ask Hillary a more personal question. Hillary is, comes from an imminent political family. Her grandfather, Lester B. Pearson, Prime Minister of Canada, her father, Jeffrey Pearson, noted diplomat, including ambassador to India, where I was born, born, and the daughter of Senator Landon Pearson. Hillary, can you tell us how, what the 
family conversation around the dinner table was and how did it lead you to where you are and your work with charities? Well, thank you, Senator Amadvar, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this conversation uh, on topics that, as you say, are uh, certainly dear to my heart and on which I have worked for many years. Uh, well, certainly coming from the family I do, uh, it's obvious that public policy is uh, to me, one of the most important uh, areas that you can work in. Uh, I studied political science at university with the thought that, uh, again, I would be perhaps going to a career in, uh, in public policy, and indeed I did work in government, uh, very much influenced by my grandfather and by my parents. Uh, and I think that it was uh, a choice that I have never regretted, although I left government uh, many years ago now, 25 years ago. Uh, but I took with me uh, this, the, the sense that public policy and how it is made and how it affects our lives and um, how much we need good evidence-based policy produced by policy makers who, are, uh, who have consulted widely, who have brought to the table, the input of people from all across the country, that that is crucial to our society, to our democracy, to uh, to our lives. So, you know, the example of my um, my grandfather, certainly, who was uh, a believer in uh, making Canada a better place, uh, and my mother, who was and is, remains at 90 years old, almost, uh, an activist, uh, she has been working in the area of children's rights all of her life as a senator. She was known as the children's senator. And, you know, when you grow up with uh, a mother like that, it's hard not to be an activist yourself. So I admit, uh, and perhaps one more thing about me personally is that I am an oldest child and the oldest child in a family um, is often the one who either gets tasked with or who will put her hand up <laughs> to to do the job. And so I've always been a joiner and I've always wanted to participate actively in, in the work that I've been engaged in, but also that the organizations that I've worked with and, and you, Senator Amitvar, as well, you know, that, that I, we have worked uh, well together on policy issues. We continue to work, I think, on policy issues. And I probably will continue doing it until, if I'm lucky, until I'm 92. I, I suspect you will, but thank you so much for putting your hand up for charities. Uh, because they have been so hard hit in yes. this pandemic. And mm -hmm. even though uh, during the crisis, I think Canadians have understood uh, the vital role, role that they play in the service infrastructure from women's shelters to food banks to youth mental health, etc. Mm -hmm. They are in crisis today. Can you paint a picture? for our listeners about what they are going through and what in your view would be necessary for Canadians to consider mm -hmm. for ensuring that charities are part of the recovery because they support the recovery. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm afraid that uh, there are many organizations in the sector uh, that are doing very, very badly and I'm afraid the news is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, there are surveys being done now by some of the umbrella organizations in the sector, such as the Ontario Nonprofit Network, that tell you that there are going to be more charities closing their doors over the next few months. There are going to be more people out of work and there are going to be more uh, services that are no longer available to society at a time when we need it most. This really is, uh, I think, an extraordinary situation um, for our country, as it is for countries around the world. and. I, unfortunately, the sector suffers from a uh, an underinvestment in its infrastructure that uh, in a situation of crisis as we are in now really shows us uh, how um, uh, just how wrong it is not to support uh, that infrastructure. You know, we're all familiar with the uh, the formula in uh, the charitable world that, you know, you don't want to spend more than 20 cents on the donor dollar for overhead. And somehow that is not a legitimate thing, overhead. 
uh, the term overhead itself, I think, is is very loaded. Uh, and what we have done is we have systematically underfunded, underinvested in, undersupported the infrastructure of charities. So now when we need digital uh, channels and infrastructure, when we need technology, when we need financial reserves, when we need uh, leadership and uh, and support for leadership that is otherwise going to burn out in the middle of this crisis, we don't have any of that. I think this is really a uh, a judgment on us all. Uh, I think the charitable sector has made uh, efforts, and and when I say the sector, I'm talking broadly about the organizations that work at a national and umbrella level to try and speak for the sector. So organizations like Imagine Canada, who have certainly over the years tried to build awareness and have tried to make the argument about the perniciousness of you know this this uh, skimping on so-called overhead. And it hasn't really, I don't think it is, we have not seen the consequences of that until now. So now alas, we're in a situation where too many charities have no financial reserves, cannot keep the doors open, cannot fundraise, uh, cannot uh, replace their burnt out leaders. It, you know, it, it's, I don't wanna be too gloomy about all this because I think that uh, people in the sector and organizations in the sector are incredibly resilient uh, and have done, more with less for years, but there's only so much more you can ask uh, them to do. So I think the notion of building back uh, a, a resiliency and investing in a resilient capacity of the sector is, is a really important one in this time. And I think it's something government should take seriously to come back to public policy and the importance of public policy. Okay. So you talked about the systematic underfunding of the sector over the years, the Senate Charities Report, which I played a role in, called it decades of neglect. Right. So on top of this underfunding, neglect, lack of, uh, of appreciation, awareness, comes the we controversy. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, uh, especially considering that, uh, that not a great deal of attention has been paid by the media on going beyond the surface of the story to the substance, which is, you know, why does a charity work a certain way? Can you can you share with us if you think uh, that the reporting has a been accurate of the sector as a whole, as mm -hmm. opposed to the specific charity? Let's put that aside and whether you see an opportunity in this crisis as well to right. correct some of the issues that we've talked about. I do, I do see an opportunity. Uh, I I think that the coverage of this uh, has, it hasn't been directly critical of the charitable sector as a whole. It's more a kind of drive-by shooting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so if one could use that um, image. It, it's more a kind of implication that, you know, charities should not be as, complex as the we structure, that charities should not engage in business or in social enterprise or in some uh, way of earning revenue that is not held within the charity itself. You know, I don't think that the media have really um, covered at all the complexities of the legislative and regulatory provisions that forced we as a charity to step outside of itself and outside of its structures to create other structures, which such as the me to we social enterprise. There's actually nothing wrong with doing that and with having a linked social enterprise that provides you with a sustainable stream of revenue, especially given what we were talking about earlier, which is the, the difficulty in persuading donors to cover your infrastructure, your legitimate infrastructure. So I don't think the media have really uh, been able to explain to the public why it is that these structures have developed as they have. Uh, what has been revealed in the WE uh, situation, I think, is the weakness of governance. And governance in the sector is something I've been interested in for a long time. It is a major vulnerability for this sector. You know, the governance is largely, as we know, volunteer boards of directors uh, and the word volunteer should not be a negative, but I think Sometimes the idea of volunteer is also associated with amateur or 
well, we don't have to take that as seriously as if it were a professional duty. In fact, you are absolutely required as a volunteer director to perform your fiduciary duty uh, towards your charity. You have to take it very seriously. And I do think that there were failures of governance in the WE situation. I don't claim to know all of the details uh, and I shouldn't comment on the specifics, but I do think that broadly speaking, we should be paying a lot of attention to governance and to strengthening governance, to training directors of the boards of charities, to, to informing and educating the public about the responsibilities of these boards. Because if you don't have a strong board and you don't have strong infrastructure, you are going to find yourself in the kind of situation potentially that, that we found itself in. Although I think the controversy has more to do with other issues that we're not going to touch on necessarily. Uh, I, I want to probe a little on this governance question. I agree completely with you. I will use your phrase. Sometimes governance and charities is drive by governance as opposed mm -hmm. to serious governance. Mm -hmm. uh, and although the matters that governance of charity that they the governance of charities deal with are incredibly weighty. They include yeah. they 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 cover issues of public trust, public services, public money. So this is a serious matter. Yes. Who's, but isn't this best left up to the organization itself and possibly to its sector organization? And does government have a role to play in the governance cauldron, mm -hmm. if I may call it? And mm -hmm. you know, when you look at how government legislates governance in the corporate sector, it mm -hmm. doesn't do that in, 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 in the voluntary sector or the mm. charitable sector. Can you comment on that? What is the role of government here? Well, I think the role of government uh, is to establish the guardrails, essentially, to establish the framework uh, within which good governance takes place. So we do have a Canada Not-for-Profit Corporations Act at the federal level. We have uh, not-for-profit uh, corporate acts at provincial level as well. Uh, and I think if any uh, board of directors of a charity pays attention to its constituting documents and its organizational framework, it will understand from legislation what are the requirements of a director. Uh, so I think actually government has done what it needs to do from a, a governance framework perspective. You know, the issues perhaps have more to do with uh, some of the uh, the lack of education and training, certainly, of governors of charities. I mean, that's been, a, I think, a, a lack, a gap in our sector, along with uh, training and support for the leadership of organizations. So often the, the executive directors or CEOs of these charities uh, also lack a sense of what is good governance. And, you know, the relationship in governance, of course, is not only the board of directors as a whole governing the organization, but the relationship between the board and the staff leadership. And if you have well uh, educated and experienced people on both sides working together effectively, you're going to have a productive relationship and one in which uh, the public interest is safeguarded. Now, there's another element to this, of course, which is as a charity, in particular, not as a nonprofit broadly, but as a charity, a charity, you are subject to the regulations of the Income Tax Act, which are administered by the Canada Revenue Agency. And I have spent a lot of my career in the last 20 years thinking about reading uh, and trying to make sense of the regulatory framework. Uh, over the years, uh, I think the Canada Revenue Agency has made genuine efforts to consult with and to work with people in the sector. I, and I, I really, I want to say that I think as a regulator, the CRA has, um, has done its best to inform, to educate, to provide um, guidance documents uh, and its interpretations. But we have an Income Tax Act that uh, when it comes to charities is poorly worded, uh, that is, that has been the sections on charities have been cobbled together and amended differently over the years. There's been no comprehensive or consistent review, as you pointed out in your, uh, your report. meeting report, indeed. Uh, and that leads to difficulties of regulation. 
because the CRA can only interpret what it sees in the Income Tax Act. So we do need, I think, a fundamental reconsideration of how, through law, we understand the role of charities, including the role of their leadership and their boards. Okay, I, that's been very helpful, but I want to go back to a question I know our listeners will want more clarification on, which mm -hmm. is, uh, why do certain charities set up a social enterprise yes. with apparently they, they 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 must have uh you know uh, boundaries and walls between these two organizations but they are often allied and associated you know i mean let's go back to we they have the we they have the me to we then they have a foundation and then they have branches all over the world it adds to the complexity but getting back to the social enterprise why is it that charities need to set up a second organization to drive a social enterprise why can't they be housed in the same making things simpler for all mm -hmm. well that's indeed uh, that's a very key question and i think it's one that we've we've been thinking about in the sector and trying to talk to government about for many years you know i think it goes back to a um, understandably, from a public policy perspective, um, an interest in keeping charity separate from business so that there is as much as possible a bright line between the two. And I think the assumption is that business is inherently for private benefit and charity is inherently for public benefit. Therefore, charities cannot engage in business activity because there will be a blurring of this boundary between charity and business. That being said, the, uh, the world of social enterprise has exploded in the past 20 years, and there are many more organizations now that have a social purpose, some of which are actually for-profit businesses, as Me Do We is, mm -hmm. and some are non-profit social enterprises. What they share is a, an interest in a social purpose. And so the, the where charities and social enterprises meet is in this idea that you are trying to accomplish something that supports a public good, a public benefit. So I think that charities are more interested in working with social enterprises because they see not only opportunities for more revenue for themselves, but also they can accomplish more and more um, effectively when they are aligned with a, an organization that is not subject to charitable regulation, but that still has that shared social purpose. Unfortunately, the way the regulatory framework works, it, it forces, first of all, a charity cannot actually engage in business activity within its own walls. You know, there are charities across the country, like a YMCA that will own buildings and will have rent paid from the ownership of its buildings. But you cannot actually set up an unrelated business or a related business um, that is uh, not run by volunteers. Um, you, know, you cannot do that because that starts to, in the view of the regulator, that starts to blur okay. this commitment to public purpose. So we would like to challenge that idea. We do believe that it is possible to combine a charitable structure and a even a for-profit enterprise structure, as long as the charity can demonstrate that it's still pursuing its charitable purpose. And at the end of the day, that's what defines that's a charity. Right. So Is it pursuing a charitable purpose? Okay. So um, you talked about uh, very good reasons why charities and business uh, should be in, in different uh, rooms of the house, uh, mm -hmm. because business is business and uh, has a profit purpose and uh, charities have a public pur purpose. Is mm -hmm. that binary construct or that bifurcation, mm -hmm. uh, does that still hold good, by the way, in today's world when we're expecting business to meet environmental standards and social justice? You know, we are, we. I'm looking at legislation in parliament that will ensure that businesses do not include, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, slave labor in anywhere in their supply chains. So we're expecting businesses to do social good, should we not accept also that charities can do business for that same purpose? I'm just 
confused by how we are stuck in a mode of thinking? Well, I think it comes back to, I agree with you completely. And I, I think it comes back to this um, overly uh, focused concentration on the activities of charities. To my mind, the most important thing to consider in determining whether a charity is indeed a charity is whether it is pursuing at all times and can show that it is in whatever activity it engages in, it is pursuing a charitable purpose and a purpose that is defined not by the Income Tax Act, but by law, by common law. We understand what those general purposes are. Uh, there's, you know, we have, for example, the alleviation of poverty would be that example of a charitable purpose. A charity should be able to engage in a number of different activities, including advocacy, public policy act, uh, advocacy work, without limitation, as long as it can demonstrate that it is pursuing its purpose in doing so, and it can show why it's necessary that it pursue that particular activity. So, in principle, pursuing a business activity, earning some revenue that will then be attached, de destined for that purpose, a destination of funds kind of approach um, should be acceptable. And it is in other jurisdictions uh, of that we know of and that we compare ourselves to, uh, it is acceptable to use that kind of approach. So again, we're arguing that, you know, the Canadian system at the federal level needs a more comprehensive review of why, uh, what is the public policy interest in defining and regulating a charity and what is the best way of doing that in a way that also allows charities to be effective partners to government? You know, to give you an example, and this is one you know very well, Senator Amvar, I know, um, but the, the Canada Revenue Agency controls very tightly the relationships between charities and non-charities. And one of the requirements they have is yep. that there would be direction and control of non-charities by charities if they're engaging in some sort of relationship where funds are being directed to a project. And we have been saying that the, the whole idea of direction and control counters a, a policy objective and trend within government towards partnering, towards working with, not to direct, but to share goals and to work together at the same table for a project of mutual interest. So to make that concrete, if you're working with an indigenous community that does not have a registered charity and you as a charity want to engage in a project uh, that clearly has a beneficial uh, impact for that community and you want to sit around a table together and talk about that project and work together as partners on that project, that would be something that the government of Canada, which is committed to reconciliation with Indigenous communities, would say is absolutely the right way to go. The Canada Revenue Agency would not allow you to do that. You would have to impose direction and control. control. Yeah. And that is counter to, I think, to a way of doing things in the 21st century now that is, it's just, it's, it's hard for people to understand. And, so, and even the even the term itself is is basically an old colonial sort of idea, right? That we are instead of working with you know indigenous people or with overseas, you know, for NGOs that are working internationally, you right. know, we're partnering with them. Instead, we are essentially controlling them, and that's a very colonial way of looking at things. That you know, for a lot of people that may not know about direction and control or charities that much, mm. might be surprised that that even exists in our in our policy when it comes to to working you know with with partner organizations so it's an it's a very interesting thing that you know especially on reconciliation with indigenous people that we really need to to look at um, yeah. I did have a question for you uh, as well, Hillary. Is this, sure. you know, this this, and and you can get into more of the direction and control as well. But I I just wanted to touch base on one little thing because I think it's it is a bit of the elephant in the room when it comes to the we issue and all of that sort of stuff. You know, most politicians when they are faced with situations like this, will essentially duck and cover or run to the hills. They will <laughs> hide and 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 you know try and push it away and or change the channel and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but the senator is, is 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 advocating that you know that that the exact opposite should happen. 
that you know this is actually the time for the government but also political parties altogether could be you know the opposition parties as well should be actually starting to take a hard look at the sector and reviewing the sector as you sort of talked about so what's your sort of plea to politicians themselves that may have this you know inclination to run away instead they should run towards the sector well i think uh, let's come back to you know the effects of the pandemic uh you know, I, I think this sharpens the mind in a way that perhaps if we had had business as usual uh, in 2020, you know, we might not be at this point. We might not have this opportunity. But I think the pandemic has both revealed the gaps and the weaknesses. And, you know, I referred to some of them at the beginning of this conversation. But of course, the impact on vulnerable populations of the pandemic have been enormous. So, and again, the charitable sector is crucial in trying to support those vulnerable populations. So it is in the interest of government, it is in the interest of politicians to pay attention to the conditions under which the charitable sector is working now, because those vulnerable populations are so dramatically affected by what has happened. We should not have had to wait for a pandemic yeah. to have this focus, to have this spotlight put on it but it yeah because it is now with us uh to come back to uh, i think the the phrase that the senator used you know the, is this an opportunity it is absolutely an opportunity and i think we have to find it's important for us as a sector to articulate this clearly to the politicians why do we matter not just because we are the good guys because we are out there you know doing good work uh, but because actually we are a sector that gets things done for populations who matter in our country. And it, for the government to have the kind of uh, impact that it wants to have, it needs us as a sector that can partner effectively with government, whether it's support for the most vulnerable, whether it's reconciliation, whether it's justice, social justice, whether it's inclusion, whether it's it's it's, um, you know, everything that has been brought up to us this summer about, you know, systemic racism and discrimination in our country, you know, that government needs us as a sector to be as strong as possible, to be as nimble as possible, to be as effective as possible, and to be as well governed as possible, <laughs> you know, to really act in partnership with government. So I think we have a great opportunity. And I think we have an argument to make. And I think politicians should care about this because if they don't care about this, I'm not sure what they do care about. Oh. And they well, should not be running away. Politicians need to understand that many of their campaign pledges would never be realizable without turning to the to the charitable and not-for-profit sector. But oh. let's move on. Let's move on to my favorite report from the Senate, the Senate. <laughs> Charities report catalyst for change yep. uh, just to let our audience know it is the most downloaded report of the Senate, which is incredible. Uh, it had 42 recommendations. I'm not I'm a realist. I'm a pragmatist. I do not expect all 42 recommendations to be seized upon and enacted. But from you who are a sector expert, which recommendations do you think are the most relevant? Mm -hmm and the most doable in the current climate, uh, the political climate that we find ourselves in? Well, of course, they're all relevant, uh, <laughs> you know, and I don't want to um, suggest that any of them might or are not, uh, but you're right, doable is the important thing. Uh, you know, and I, I come back, of course, to my view, which is that um, there, are, there are certain recommendations that are important and relevant because they are the leverage. They represent the leverage for other things to happen. So, you know, changing the Income Tax Act uh, and focusing us on purposes rather than activities would be a leverage recommendation because with that, many other things become possible. So my focus would be on the some of them could be administrative changes. Uh, they, you made a number of recommendations in the report um, that were directed at the Canada Revenue Agency. Uh, and there are many things that the Canada Revenue Agency can do, at least you know, within the broad boundaries of the, the Income Tax Act. 
those are doable. Those are things that could happen sooner rather than later. And of course, one of the hats I wear these days is um, co-chair of the advisory committee on the charitable sector, which was set up by the federal government. And we really, um, I, I do want to acknowledge uh, the um, the importance of that, of, of setting up a permanent advisory structure to the CRA uh, and allowing us, giving us that channel uh, in the sector to get to uh, the CRA on a regular basis uh, and also to to have a mandate for reform. This is not just a, you know, all things are good, you know, we're simply giving you um, advice, you know, here and there. No, 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 I, you know, we do have a reform agenda and a lot of it is based on the things that were said in the report and recommended in the report. So I think, you know, these would be the things that I would want to work on. But there's another recommendation that you made um, that was a, an administrative recommendation, but it was the home and government recommendation. And, uh, you know, honestly, I have been doubtful in the past about the possibility of having a single home in government. Uh, and I part of the reason for that is that it's been hard for me to see where in the federal government you could place a unit that actually would have to have a horizontal mandate because the sector is just so diverse and there are so many different uh, parts of the sector that interact with different government departments. So you, you have had a silo approach in the past, you know, Environment Canada deals only with the environmental groups and Heritage deals only with the arts groups, etc. You do need that horizontal perspective that's been missing up to now. And even though I'm not entirely sure where that home and government should be, I think it is absolutely crucial to have it. And the pandemic once again has has kind of changed my mind that, that I think that's more of a priority than I would have said a year ago. Uh, we need that policy, that horizontal policy perspective. So I would be asking for that. Okay, I, I'm I'm glad you agree with the with the thrust of our proposal. We called yeah. for a home in government. We actually named the ministry, you but did. I agree with you. It doesn't really matter, or it it does matter as long as it's a ministry that that is able to connect uh, the sector horizontally uh, right. to its various institutions. Exactly. Uh, let's talk about money. We're talking about charities. We're talking about philanthropy. We're talking about big money, big dollars, the, yep. uh, the 80 billion dollars of assets held by private foundations in Canada. Money does make the world go round. It will make this world in Canada go around a little faster if we had more of it. Yeah. So I come to the question about disbursement quotas, which is for my listeners, the mandat mandatory annual amount of money that foundations must disperse. And at, today it stands at 3.5% of their assets. Yeah. This uh, uh, disbursement quota has has been declining steadily over the years. You know, it was 10% at one point, then it dropped to, I think, 8%, then it dropped to, my figures might not be exactly correct, but I'm correct in, 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 in observing a steady decline in the disbursement quota, which means that private foundations need, can if they choose to, and I want to accept the fact that there are many foundations, many progressive foundations, mm -hmm. including the one that I used to lead, which put out far more than the minimal amount. But yeah. yet, can you explain to us why the disbursement quota has de decreased down to 3.5% and whether or not, if in this crisis of all crises, where we are asking Canadians to dig deep into their pockets, to uh, a suffer hardship of, of an unimagined kind. I'm thinking of low income uh, earners or uh, or people in the in precarious work. Why we can't also expect charities and foundations to step up to the plate and for the government to increase the disbursement quota. I'm not taking a position on how much it should be, but I, I'm taking a position that it must increase. Would you comment on that? Uh, yes, how much time have you got? <laughs> <laughs> uh, two points I think to make on this. Um, one is that, you know, the disbursement quota as a measure is, is not really, I think, the, the most important question. I think it's, it's more a question of, do we want to have funds, endowment funds that are set aside for the public good for the long term, 
So to me, the question is the short term versus the long term. That's point number one. You know, do we agree that we need to have both short term funding that goes out annually, that is given by many, many generous Canadians year after year, uh, and longer term funding, mostly held through endowed funds, uh, which are endowed for that reason, to be for the long term. And that the money that is dispersed year over year from those long term funds is actually going to be used uh, to fund projects that have a long time horizon, where the results are not going to be seen for many years, uh, or where the, the, the risk level is very high, and therefore uh, either individual donors or governments certainly, or even or businesses, are, are not prepared to advance money. We need that long-term money. We do need that multi-generational perspective that um, an endowment can give you. So if you agree that we have a need for both short-term and long-term, then I think we need endowments. And if that's the case, then we need to have a, uh, a management of that endowment that allows it to be sustained over time. So the idea of the disbursement quota itself was not so much about the maximum, it was about the minimum. It was about, it was a public policy rule that was put in to ensure that endowments, that though the donors who received a public benefit in the form of tax incentive for giving that money would not then simply allow that money to sit there never being dispersed. If you have that, and then I think there's a legitimate public policy question, you know, why would we give a tax incentive to a donor if that money then just sits in, in a fund somewhere? It's not doing any public good to anybody. So let's put in at least a minimum requirement. The minimum can always be exceeded. And as you say, you know, there are many foundations in Canada and funds of various kinds in Canada that do exceed the three and a half. It's a floor, not a ceiling. But I think that in this, again, in this pandemic situation, the focus on the short term is so urgent. It's so immediate that, that understandably, and I have argued for this publicly, and I've said this many times now, I think there's absolutely an obligation on foundations to endowments, which have typically been there for the long term to fund more in the short term. And it might mean encroaching on capital. And it might mean that your fund doesn't grow or doesn't sustain you know, itself in the same way that it would have in another year. But that's okay because the need is there. That said, I don't think regulation is the right way to go about uh, forcing long-term endowments to disperse for the short term. I think there is certainly a moral suasion, a moral ar obligation, a moral argument uh, that these funds and foundations should consider dispersing more. Some of them will say, well, we can't actually because our donors have restricted these funds and therefore we cannot do anything about it. Well, that might be true. That might be true. I, I think that's true in the case of some donor advised funds at community foundations or other public foundations. Uh, I still think the leadership of those foundations, you know, should be able to stand up and say, actually, it matters. We've got to put it out there now. The rainy day is here. We're not going to save it for 10 years from now. And you know, if we haven't had the pandemic, we might still be, want, be wanting to make this moral argument now because climate change is with us. And you know, the argument that our world 10 years from now looks nothing like the world we have today and that the misery and the need and the dislo dislocation and the disruption is going to be huge to the point where, you know, an endowment makes no sense. Why well, think 30 years yeah, from now yeah. when everything is needed now. But we aren't, we aren't quite there yet. And I actually think that foundations and endowments can do a lot in thinking about climate change and what needs to be done now and funded over the next 10 years to get us to the point where in 10 years, we're actually better able to cope with what is coming. So setting aside the pandemic and the need for the urgent, you know, mm -hmm. I think that there is still a valid argument for the long term. And I think regulation that forces endowed funds to spend a lot now and for the future uh, because once you change a regulation like that it's it's in the income tax act I mean it's 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 very awkward it's it means as we've been discussing earlier it's hard to change legislation, to change you know? legislation. and if you put something in legislation then you're stuck with it so to my mind the disbursement quota should actually be a flexible thing it should be something that could be adjusted administratively 
and might be tied to, and this idea has been discussed, you know, in the past, uh, that it might be indexed to some sort of um, measure of, you know, the health of financial markets and, you know, the ways in which endowments manage to, you know, sustain themselves through the return on their investment. That might be a reasonable thing to talk about. Um, but I resist the call right now for, um, you know, an enforced um, increase to say 10% or 15% because I think that can have unintended consequences. Okay. Uh, I want to move to another conversation that is happening that has that has been embraced by Canadians with uh, surprising vigor and and activism. That is the conversation on anti-racism um, mm. uh, and uh, discrimination, privilege, all of that. When you think about charities, when you especially think about philanthropy, yeah. there is an element of embedded privilege in, 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 in that construct. So this mm -hmm. is more of a philosophical question, in fact. Is philanthropy not inherently elitist and therefore possibly part of the structural systemic issues that we're talking about? Should mm. it even exist in, in a perfect world that is mm. inclusive, equitable, anti-racist in its, in its most advanced expression? Mm -hmm. oh, these are fundamental questions <laughs> uh, and you know, no easy answers. Uh, yes, I think that there is a questioning of the elitist uh, nature of philanthropy, especially foundation philanthropy, that that we have to acknowledge. Uh, and, you know, I think um, what, what I've found interesting, actually, is the willingness of foundations uh, in the immediate uh, aftermath of the, the lockdown um, and the beginnings of the pandemic. The, the change that foundations made apparently fairly willingly in their practices. So, you know, a number of Canadian foundations went from uh, a, a norm in which they had grants being made with all kinds of conditions attached, uh, you know, single year grants with all kinds of uh, requests for reporting and uh, delays in getting the money out and a lot of supervision, uh, you know, essentially a direction and control approach, you know, to, to granting. Um, they dropped all that. And they said immediately, no, we're going to disperse the money uh, without condition, uh, without uh, requirement for reporting, without requirement for some sort of detailed proposal. Uh, and we're not going to come back and ask you and we're not going to monitor you to death. You know, we are going to trust you. This is participatory. Well, actually, it's, it's trust based philanthropy. I would not have thought that Canadian foundations and not all, of course, but they're you know, the ones that we know about that are willing to talk about what they're doing. Um, that those foundations would have changed their practice so quickly. And that is a shifting of power, yes. yeah. because that's what that's about, really. That's saying, I, I, I abandon control. I, I trust you. You know what to do. You're on the ground. You need it here. Now, are they going to continue that? You know, is that shifting of power going to become permanent? Hard to say. Hard to say. I, I hope that there is at least some of it. But I think, you know, the pendulum swings and there will probably be a swing back towards um, somewhat more control. And to put a, a positive uh, lens on that, I, I think that there is a legit, especially if the foundation is interested in accomplishing something over the long term with partners, that it, it might make more sense to say, OK, well, we're going to come back to what we were doing before as a strategic approach. We're not just simply going to spread it out there and just let whatever happens happens because actually we do want to accomplish something that is is um is going to take a number of years and we need to work on it with partners but i think the essential thing is is no longer the foundation behind closed walls in its board you know mm -hmm. at a table which is not a diverse board table uh you know making decisions that don't involve the community partners can't do that can't do that anymore we have to find ways of at the very least if we're not engaging in that full trust-based philanthropy that we are engaging in participatory philanthropy yeah. in the sense that you know we we are working as partners together here get away from direction and control you know you don't need to do that you know you need to be able to sit down and talk about what's needed and you need to be able to let go of some of the power that you were exercising over your grantees and that will be the interesting thing to see 
will that happen in Canadian philanthropy? One well, the... I, I want to uh, share an anecdote from my past in philanthropy. In 2001, when I was president of Maitri, a local foundation, a, a foundation in Toronto, works nationally, but located in Toronto. Uh, I created a funders network on racism and poverty. Hillary, yeah. you may well remember that. This was 2001 and I remember our first meeting was on September 11th, 2001. As the towers were coming down, we were having our first meeting. I have to admit that was really heavy lifting and we weren't able uh, to go to the extent that now uh, apparently foundations are going. I'm really pleased to hear that. All we were able to do was to commit to training of ourselves. We yes. weren't, a, you know, and, and, and some joint funding, but not mm -hmm. the kind of philosophical shift in giving up power and privilege. We right. weren't able to get there. So this is very heartening, and I'm certainly hoping it will continue. You talked about board tables. Uh, in mm. in the sector. Uh, so, you know, I'm a huge admirer of the sector, but I'm also what I hope is called a constructive critic. One of my Absolutely. Uh, one of my problems with the sector has been there. There uh, it's it's unwillingness to go beyond talking about diversity and move towards embracing it in a more fulsome way and you know we've done research we've had pockets of research done by the diversity institute and others that sort of tells you the same story mm -hmm. canada's charities and not profits serve a very diverse country but their boardrooms are primarily made up of what you would call demographically old canada mm. so you know i've i've put out a call to the sector uh, that they need to voluntarily measure because evidence, as you said, matters. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm working now with Stats Canada to put out a national voluntary survey. But, but do you think the sector needs to, uh, to embrace and 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 put on a lens of diversity? Uh, everything it does on its leadership, uh, on its programs, on who it does business with, how it does business. Is, can you reflect on that and can you tell me if there is, if there are some best practices out there outside the ones that you've already mentioned, which are amazing? Mm. Yeah, I, I think the diversity uh, and inclusion conversation is going to continue now. Um, you know, I, my former organization, Philanthropic Foundations Canada, had actually started to do this uh, a year or two ago. Um, arguably, we were late to the table, um, but it, you know, it has come, the work is coming at a time when the public demand for it is, is now very clear and vocal. Um, and I think we had started with the just simply the notion of trying to understand where in the, the what in the foundation community was uh, was going on. You know, how many people were having conversations about diversity and inclusion? What was the makeup of the boards of the foundations who were members of PFC? No surprise, because many of them are yeah. family foundations. Um, they weren't very diverse. And, uh, you know, unfortunately also, um, they were still more male dominated than they, they, there wasn't even gender balance um, in the boards of these families. Uh, and, you know, clearly there was a gap. Uh, now there are ways of dealing with uh, diversity and bringing diverse opinions to the table and diff different perspectives to the table, even if you are a family, um, which have to do with the structures that you use for decision-making and the ways in which you consult and the ways in which you agree to talk to people in, in the community. Again, getting away from decision making within the walls of your family foundation. It is entirely possible to do that. And I think the next steps that PFC took uh, in this were to create a toolkit uh, for a family and other kinds of foundations that would give them some sense of what they could do. Uh, and that toolkit's out there, uh, and I think it's a very useful toolkit. It's it's, uh, it's extremely well done, uh, and I, I think it, it'll go into the conversation that, as I said, I think is going to be ongoing. It doesn't get at 
the more fundamental question that you've already raised, which is the elitism conversation. You know, should, do foundations have legitimacy at all? You know, yep. if if foundations are created through wealth that has been earned by uh, people uh, who have essentially made that wealth through um, an unequal system, then is it legitimate for them to be able to conserve that wealth through a foundation, even if they don't own it anymore? Uh, and uh, should we be doing away with the foundation model? I mean, I think that is the view that um, is being expressed pretty strongly uh, yeah. by by people, and, and I can understand that. I, I still believe that there is value in the model, regardless of where the wealth is generated. But I absolutely fundamentally agree that if foundations don't open up, and this question comes back to transparency, what is your obligation as a foundation to being transparent, to being accountable, to not being managed as the private uh, wealth dispensing, philanthropy dispensing kind of structure owned by a family. You know, I, I just think we have to get away from that thinking. A foundation model, as in a long-term endowment that is used for public benefit for many years and on projects that are important to community and are directed by community, that's a good model. You know, it goes back to my saying earlier, we need both the short-term and the long-term. But I think models in which we have secretive and unaccountable uh, decision making um, is that is not that is not possible anymore. So What's, now that I'm no longer I, with C, I can be a little more vocal about this, and you know, perhaps at the risk of, uh, and I certainly don't want to offend uh, many generous foundation board members and leaders. You know, there are there are incredibly generous uh, foundation leaders in this country. But I think the urgency of showing that you are accountable and that you are transparent and that you are inclusive, you know, that urgency is greater than ever. One of the things I was wondering, uh, just just going back to what, uh, you know, essentially would be potentially the government's role in this, yeah. um, you know, if, if, you know, for the listeners a, a couple of years ago, the, you know, the C25, which was essentially looking at diversity on corporate boards in Canada. So, so, so federally regulated businesses was passed. Now, you know, the center and I could sit here and say that it didn't go far enough. It didn't include targets. It didn't include a, you know, a variety of things that were, you know, necessary, you know, from our perspective to beef up diversity on corporate boards, but at least it was there, you know, at least it's there for federal legged regulated Related businesses to have that they have to do diversity plans. They have to, you know, let their shareholders know about it. They have to let the government know about it. So at least there's something there, and we're going to see how how this approach actually starts to work because it finally came into force earlier this year. Mm -hmm. But there's really nothing there in this this type of area for charities or nonprofits for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm curious about you know what you think about you know what the government should do this government or, or subsequent governments, you know, down the road, either, you know, the, the charities report talks about the tax forms and, and at least getting some data, you know, about diversity, uh, you know, so charities would have to fill out on their tax filings, how much diversity they have on their, you know, governance boards. But is there, is, is that something that we should be looking at or is there other steps, you know, more of a, a approach that, that the Senator tried to take with C25 to have, you know, targets and, and plans and all that sort of stuff. So what, what role can the government play in this? Yeah, well, I, I do think that the government can help. Um, I think that data is crucial. I think that collecting that data is important. And I think ultimately that the government is best placed to do that. Uh, that being said, I know that the government uh, worries about things like privacy and about uh, being overloading perhaps um, a data collection system and not now I'm talking about the, the form, the annual form that charities use to report to the regulator. I, I know that there's a concern that you know you can overload that report with questions that aren't necessarily directly pertinent to the regulator's function. Yep. The regulator is trying to make sure that the charity is complying with the law. Does it need to know about diversity in order to, to ensure that that's happening? Arguably not. Um, Unfortunately, though, 
you know, there isn't any other systematic collection of data by government of uh, the sector. And this is a long-standing ask, actually, of the, that the sector has made of government. Help us collect more and better data on this sector. It's a crucial economic sector, as the senator said at the beginning. Uh, and it's it's a sector that if you want to have evidence based policy, you need to have good data and you don't have it, you government. Therefore, it's something you need to have as a tool to put more money into collecting data. And I think if one could use StatsCan or other departments of government and not lean so much on the CRA, then I think you know we might be able to generate some very interesting data, including that diversity data that I think would be would tell us a lot more about what the sector looks like now and where the gaps may be and what it is that could then inform different kinds of policy tools and programming for government. So I could continue to talk to you for hours, but I won't uh, because our, our <laughs> listeners are also, you know, I'm, I'm keeping in mind our listeners, uh, yes. but you know, we could talk about the definition of charity, the evolution of uh, common law in, in, in the Income Tax Act, et cetera, et cetera, but we won't. We probably will have to call you back again sometime. I know you're very busy. You're also now the incoming Chancellor of the University of Guelph, I think. Uh, Brock, Brock University. Brock, Brock University, Brock. sorry, got yeah. the university wrong. And so you've got your hands played, you're advising the minister, you are, you know, heading up a university and you're making all, you're moving the needle, Hillary, in many, many ways. So you are a wonderful person to have on this podcast with us. So I want to thank you very much. And I want to turn over uh, to our listeners to ask uh, them uh, to comment on this podcast, to send us ideas uh, of change makers, because remember, we are wanting to talk to change makers who move the needle or more than a needle, move an ocean in different ways. So I look forward to hearing from you and do remember to tune in to the next uh, podcast that we will be uh, podcasting. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you.